It is week 15. Joe Flacco is back from the dead. The Bears have an elite defense. The Chiefs are garbage and the Eagles are frauds. Welcome to the NFL, EJ. How you doing? I'm <laughs> good. I'm not sure what, what piece of that is true, but that is our aim on today's podcast. <laughs> Basically none you, of it. <laughs> take you through a bunch of that stuff and tell you what really matters because, yeah, there were a lot of confusing results on Sunday on a lot of fronts. We're not going to talk about all of them. We're going to touch on a lot of them. We'll give you a little update of the playoff picture because it has changed. And then, yeah, we'll go through five storylines that I think are going to be some of the most interesting ones heading into the playoffs. Um, not necessarily because those are the top teams, but because they are teams or players that are going to influence that picture that we didn't necessarily see coming. Before we really get into the meat of the show, we're going to start off with a little playoff snapshot. Uh, you know, where everything stands as of right now after all the chaos of of week 15. Um, full disclosure, we're recording this in the middle of Monday, so the, the two Monday night games have not happened yet. And if you have an issue with these standings and seedings, if they change, take it up with ESPN because this is coming from the ESPN playoff machine. So we have the, uh, in the AFC, division leaders are the Dolphins, Ravens, Jags, and Chiefs. Uh, Jags and Chiefs in particular, barely hanging on at this point, but they're still hanging on. And then the uh, the AFC wildcard teams are the Colts, Steelers, and Browns. So as of right now, basically three quarters of the AFC North is in, but the Bengals are coming in hot, so we'll see what happens there. And then the NFC. Four division leaders are the Cowboys, which are the new, perhaps temporary, division leader in the NFC East after their big win over the Eagles last night. You still got the Lions. Uh, the Buccaneers have retaken the top spot in the NFC South, or maybe perhaps for the first time in the NFC South. I don't know if they've actually led it before this year. Again, that whole division outside of Carolina is right next to each other, so might be a little bit of a merry-go-round between now and the end of the season. And then the 49ers firmly in control of the NFC West. Um, very possible that we get an additional wild card team from the NFC West, but they're going to have to go through the NFC North, where the NFC wild card teams right now are the Packers, Vikings, and of course the Eagles are in the five seed, and I don't think they're giving, giving that one up anytime soon, even with their recent issues. I will say, uh, you know, we left the Packers for dead not too long ago. <laughs> About a month ago, I would say, we, we left them for dead. And now they're a completely different ball club with the resurgence of Jordan Love. And, you know, lafleur has been in his bag. The defense is playing better. Also something we would not have said a month ago, but is now very close to being a reality. And things have escalated very quickly. <laughs> The Chiefs now only have a one-game lead in the AFC West over the Broncos, whose defense has played exceptionally well over the last couple months. Vance Joseph has done a phenomenal job turning them around, you know, making uh, sweeping personnel changes, you know, jettisoning some veteran edges that were giving them nothing in favor of Cooper and Benito and Browning, you know, giving Jaquan McMillan a chance, and he's become one of the best playmaking DBs in the NFL. Sertan's still doing his thing. You got Simmons and Locke on the back end. Singleton and Jewel have been impact players for them. Allen's been a great pickup for them. You know, all of a sudden the defense is playing, like, at minimum, like a top 10 unit over the last couple months. And Russ and Cortland Sutton have provided just enough magic on the other side uh, to to help them win, was it six of their last seven? And all of a sudden, they find themselves nipping at the heels of the Chiefs, who just went down again to the Bills for probably the, the third time this year because of a, a mistake that their receiving core has made. And so I guess my overall question to you is, start things off today, are the Chiefs screwed? Screwed might be rich because they still have Andy Reid and they still have Patrick Mahomes. And as we've said in previous years where, look, those are very different teams. As long as you have those two, you have a chance. We said that, I don't know, tongue in cheek, but we were like, yeah, they got more than a chance, right? This year, I think the statement holds true, but it is just that. It is a chance for the first time rather than a certainty. And that's the shift. So... Mahomes venting at the end of the game, both to the refs and to Josh Allen, was uncharacteristic. Pat is 
has been throughout his career, one of the classiest players in the NFL. He has been, uh, he's had plenty to complain about this year, but he has not taken opportunities to do that. In fact, in the way that you would expect a quarterback and team leader and quite frankly, face of the NFL to do, he has defended them and, you know, not thrown them under the bus, despite them probably deserving it at several junctures, hasn't taken that path. Took the low road last night, was super frustrated, was openly yelling at officials before he left the field, uh, you know, said to Josh Allen when he knew there would be mics around, it's the worst MF and call I've ever seen, right? And then went to the press conference and suggested that the officiating was somehow tarnishing Travis Kelsey's Hall of Fame candidacy. Like, Wait, hold on, I missed that. Yeah, he basically <laughs> said it, it, it. taking greatness away from a player like this is just like, I forget the word he used. I, it wasn't shameful, but something like it. it was all off the deep end and it was all like super uncharacteristic. We've not seen any of that from Mahomes, And suddenly like the dam just broke. The frustration boiled over. I think that's what it is. It feels like the lid just boiling off for the pass game. Absolutely sucking for most of the year and not hauling its weight, especially not in a way that, you know, either the Chiefs or the Chiefs fandom is used to it doing propelling them to the great amount of success that they've had. And at the very least, it means the cracks are starting to show publicly. Now, we got to ask in the wake of all that, like how much Eric Bieniemy not being there is being felt, how much his absence now that he's in Washington. And people will say, well, Andy was calling the plays. It doesn't really matter. There was a steadying influence there for a long time. And the Chiefs have had many roller coasters through all these successful seasons, and they've come out, you know, playoff game at home every year for Mahomes since he started, right? Since he is the starting mm-hmm. quarterback, he has played a playoff game at home every year. The at least one. Might, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The fact that he might have to play one on the road this year, everybody's, ah, <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> relax. Back to EB. Like, he was at some point, steadying influence that helped right the ship through all those ups and downs and he's not there this year and they've not been able to do it they've made a bunch of adjustments they haven't worked the frustrations continue to grow we saw like as you said another mistake from the wide receiver core that ended up costing this game and he lost it he just lost it i don't blame him but he lost it we haven't seen that so that's yeah, in terms of them not being screwed the other side of the ball defense is still kicking ass like spags is crushing it he held josh allen to 20 points picked him off once like that's hard to do josh is a powerful offensive player and you know the defense gave the chiefs a chance to win certainly all they needed is three touchdowns and the extra points right that doesn't seem a lot typically hasn't been too much for the chiefs to overcome but the offense couldn't pick it up so half the team still playing at an elite level and we'll see how they rally they still have a chance but for the first time in a long time, it's just that, just a chance and not a certainty. Just kind of looking at it uh, from a, a human perspective, um, you know, the the outburst from Mahomes, it seems at least to me like he's really frustrated with his receivers and he didn't want to take it out on them publicly because he very easily could have, right? This is like the third or fourth time this year that – the receivers have cost them a game. And Tony, his second time in front of America where he's cost them a game directly. And I think I think Pat is just incensed because he knows that in the past, this team would have had the first seed easily. Easily, right? Especially with this kind of defense. And they had enough, not even like, It's not even just about making plays. It's about reliability. And it's about just doing your job, being in the right place at the right time so that Pat, as a playmaker, can carry them over the top. But when Pat feels like he has to play against the other team and his own receiving core at the same time, like I I understand how that's so frustrating. And he doesn't want to call them out in front of America because that creates arguably a worse narrative of Mahomes is being a bad leader, is being a bad teammate. And so he took it out on the refs. He took it out 
he, he took out his frustration in a way that wouldn't seem like he was pointing the finger at his own teammates, at the guys that he has to look at in the building every single day. And I'm sure if he could go back, he would change how he handled it. Um, but, but it happened. And it is what it is. Now, I will say in regards to the actual Tony penalty, it was a penalty. Okay? And it was a blatant penalty like wasn't even close there was a a video that emerged on twitter today i don't know if you've seen it that you know some some people within chief's kingdom are kind of coping and saying like look as he ran up to get into his spot like he kind of like half-hearted pointed the ref like that's not checking okay that's not checking checking is you get set then you look over you give a little thumbs up, say, I'm good, and then the ref will nod or say no, and then you got to get... Like, he wasn't even set. He wasn't even in his spot. He just, as he was running over, he pointed at the ref and then got set. And then, like, and then Rasheed Rice, the rookie, over on the other side actually did it right. Got set, gave the thumbs up, did the little check, made sure he was good. So it's like Kadarius Tony, after years of being in the NFL, makes a procedural mistake that cost them the game a mistake that has literally never happened in Andy Reid's entire career. It's the first time any any in 25 years that any of his teams have gotten called for offensive offsides, right? And I understand why the frustration boiled over because it's like fucking Kadarius again. Again. Just not thinking. Not not having it cross his mind when he is lined up and he is set. Hmm, I could see Creed Humphrey's face. Why can I see Creed Humphrey's face? Oh, because I'm lined up like as deep as a, a defensive lineman. A yard. Like, like a full a yard. yard. <laughs> and it's like just have the awareness, have have the discipline to not be the one to screw it up. And for a long time, the Chiefs were disciplined. The Chiefs had awareness. The Chiefs were a smart football team that when a play absolutely had to be made, they would make it and nobody would screw it up. They could be down 24 points and you would still have confidence that they would come back because of that discipline and that awareness and just how good this team was in crunch time. And now, because of players like Kadarius Tony that don't have discipline, like I get nervous when they're up by seven. Because I feel like somehow they're going to screw it up. And a lot of times this season they have. So, again, to kind of circle back, I don't think Pat was as frustrated at the refs as he was with his own teammates, but he couldn't take it out on his teammates publicly. So he took it out on the refs. I don't know if he'll get fined or whatever. He probably won't. But it's a it's a very human moment from a guy who... Uh, who has been let down repeatedly this year. And on some level, I get it. The Bills won the game fair and square. They were the better team. The Chiefs legitimately are in trouble offensively. But I understand I understand Mahomes' reaction. For sure. It's very human, and he is used to an obscenely high standard. Like, the standard he has set since starting in the league is higher than anyone. And that is anyone in history. It's higher than Brady. It's higher than anybody else you want to bring up. He hasn't, doesn't have the longevity and yet that Brady had, but in terms of his start, his first basically five years, untouchable standard of excellence. And yeah, that did lead to assumptions of it doesn't matter how far he has to go, how much he's down, he's going to lead that team back. And even a regression to neutral where you're like, I don't know, maybe he could do it to toss up 50-50 feels like a huge drop to him. Because he has just assumed through his own ability that he is going to be able to make up those gaps. And he couldn't do it, not even close, yesterday. And that's got to be incredibly frustrating. And yes, he's human. It is, it's too much of a standard, I think, to hold these guys to say, oh, never lash out. I don't think any of us would have lasted this long, quite frankly, given what, again, the standard you're used to and then you're working with a new crew as you are every year in the NFL and it's not working out the same way. And yeah, you blow a gasket. Are they going to recover? Sure. They're going to recover. They're going to reset. They probably already have, 
It's probably water under the bridge to them. They're on to next, and they have problems to clean up, and it's largely on the offensive side, and it's largely really in the passing game because that the rushing game is working. They just don't use it, so it's not like they're completely hapless or hopeless on offense, but the balance isn't there, and that magic that they had with EB of, again, the right play call at the right time, the right lever to pull at a big moment, you just came to expect it. Now, that's not normal (laughs) but it was for the chiefs has been for the chiefs for a long time and now that it's not yeah they're reeling a little bit one thing really quick and then we'll get right back to the show we are smack dab in the middle of the holiday season and if you find yourself in the market for any active wear crew necks jackets quarter zips i mean anything at all for either yourself or someone you love check out today's sponsor, Viore. If you're watching the YouTube version of this show, I'm wearing one of their crewnecks right now in burgundy, but they also have a variety of other colors and styles. And I also have this exact same crew neck in cream that I love even more. Their entire brand is all about creating clothes that you can be active in or go out in. And obviously that means an extensive active wear line for both men and women, but they also carry a ton of styles for the office or just lounging around the house and watching football. They make clothes for people of all sizes and body types, and the material of quality for each garment is really good. Everything that I have from Viore has been washed several times at this point, and you wouldn't even know the difference. It still feels brand new. So again, if you're shopping either for yourself or someone you love, or even someone you just mildly like this holiday season, I highly recommend checking out the Viore catalog at viore.com slash filmroom. Again, that is V-U-O-R-I dot com slash film room. That is the link in the description below. And if you find something you like within that collection, you can get 20% off your first purchase. And on any orders over $75, you're also going to get free shipping and free returns if you end up deciding anything is not for you. So that's a pretty good deal for first time customers. Again, available at the link in the description below, viore.com slash film room. Thank you again to Viore for sponsoring this show. And with that, let's get back to it. Now, next game on the docket, uh, full disclosure, I did not expect to be talking about this one this week because I, you know, going into it, I thought the Ravens were going to railroad the Rams just like they've done to a lot of teams this year. You know, looking at the talent disparity, um, well, I shouldn't say disparity. The Rams are just young, Mm -hmm. like they're young, right? And the Ravens have been a threshing machine the entire year on offense and defense. And I, I felt like the youth of the Rams just wasn't wasn't going to be ready as good as Stafford is as good as Cup is as good as like the the core veterans they have are I just didn't think there was going to be enough for them to compete in this game and then they came out and were it not for an incredible punt return in overtime to win it in a walk-off fashion the Rams could have won this game they came damn close to winning this game and I, I, I don't necessarily believe in moral victories or anything in the NFL. Either, either you win or you lose. But I'll tell you what. If I was Sean McVay and I look at how that squad competed, how the young guys competed and made plays, how Matthew Stafford against a, a league high pressure rate for the week of 55%, like Ravens led the NFL in pressure rate this, this week. And how he still was just throwing it all over the yard and, and you know, leaving it out there for Puka to make a crazy diving catch and Cooper Cup doing his thing. And, you know, we took him to the wire, like all the way down to the mud. And they they barely survived the Rams. If I'm Sean McVay, I look at that performance and I say, you know what? We got something here. We might not be ready in 2023. Maybe we'll barely squeak into the playoffs as a wild card at best. But 2024, I feel good about it. And again, I, I I don't necessarily believe in moral victories, but I do believe in indicators. And that game was an indicator that the Rams are almost there. McVay is doing a hell of a job with his young Rams. And we've said that several times throughout the year, but I don't think ever as emphatically as after this week, because the Ravens are the Ravens. They are a power in the AFC one of the most powerful teams in the NFL, one of the most balanced teams in the NFL. And the Rams are on the road with terrible weather. They're in the Ravens' house, and they almost beat them straight up. Not crazy plays, not fake punts, not like straight up head-to-head. 
The Rams almost beat the Ravens. And if I thought I'd be saying that a month ago, I would have sort of checked my math and gone, wait a minute, what what year is it? Like, no, that's that's not this year. But it's pretty incredible. We've talked a lot about Stafford. He's obviously a key to this entire thing. Aaron Donald is still Aaron Donald and getting double and triple teamed and still harassing Lamar. And all that is true. Cooper Cup's been dinged up a little bit, and I feel like he's that wily old junk ball pitcher right now. He does not have all of his gas, it's pretty clear, but he saves it up to win at the right moment and then just roasts somebody. He had a great day yesterday. He was a difference in this game. Uh, If they hadn't had him, they wouldn't have been close. Can't always say that about some of his other performances this year, but it, it was yesterday. And Davis Allen, the young guys, we talked so much about the Rams youth. We've talked about Kobe Turner. We've talked about, you know, other young guys on defense. And of course, we talk about Puka, or Puka, but Davis Allen sighting. Like Davis Allen was one of those guys I thought was underrated when he came out in last year's tight end class. Not a lot of people were talking about him. And he is, he's limited. He's not a sort of all everything, all world tight end, but I really like the skills he had and showed on tape. And he's been basically third on the depth chart all year for the Rams, but Rams had a bunch of injuries. Davis Allen got out, had a couple of nice catches, moved the chains a couple of times in this one. And it, you know, we talk a lot about, we were talking pre-show about teams that develop talent, young talent, and teams that don't. Like the Rams are developing young talent. So in addition to being further along faster than we thought, i.e. taking the Ravens to the mat at their place in bad weather, you look at these young players who are continuing to make plays for the Rams, more plays for the Rams every week. And then a guy who's been, you know, deep down the depth chart, McVay and his staff are coaching up and down the line. And some coaches in the NFL do, and some coaches don't. And you can see it on both sides of the ball. And yeah, that is a tremendously good indicator if you're a Rams fan for even the rest of this year, but certainly next year. I also want to emphasize, um, the ground game in particular, you know, so kind of what what the Rams are doing early on to the Ravens. And again, they, they couldn't do it the entire game because the offensive line isn't isn't there yet. But from a schematic perspective, the first drive for the Rams made me think, hmm, in January, could one of the other AFC contenders do that? to Baltimore because it was the first time I ever saw somebody kind of impose their will on the ground uh, against the Ravens. Now, again, the Ravens defensive line after that first drive where the Rams ran it nine straight times to get down to the red zone. After that first drive, the Ravens were like, hold on, fuck off. Like, no, we're not doing this anymore, right? But in that first drive, I mean, you saw a McVay masterclass in terms of scheme like he clearly had a good idea of of how Mike McDonald structures this defense particularly their nickel package where you got Kyle Hamilton down as a nickel they play at field boundary they don't play it strong side weak side it's it's all field boundary and they start out in these two high safety structures and then they'll they'll roll down into a bunch of different stuff they could play cover one out of it they could play cover three quarters quarter quarter half whatever right they they start in, in too high and then they'll like as the ball is snapped they'll get into whatever they're doing except if there's motion especially motion across the formation jet motion in particular they handle that motion differently depending on if it's going towards the field side where Hamilton is or the boundary side where Hamilton is not if it's jet motion towards Hamilton they're going to bump everything out Hamilton will handle it If it's jet motion away from Hamilton, they'll spin the safeties down and they'll get into a single high structure. They'll have the safety go down immediately in the flat. Then the other safety, which is behind Hamilton, will then go into a deep post. And so if you know exactly where the safeties are going to go based on jet motion, McVay abused that early in the game when they were running the ball nine straight times to start that drive again. And I think it was like seven out of the nine runs had jet motion attached to it, either going towards the field or towards the boundary. And they would package it with inside zone. They'd package it with duo. Um, you know, th- there was a, a an insert. There was a couple insert plays where they had Puka basically playing fullback for him in like a Ben Skoranek type role, but it was Puka instead. Um, there was a jet sweep that they actually handed off after figuring out how they were, you know, it, they kind of used the first five runs of like, okay, let's make sure they're still spinning it this way. And then we'll 
then we'll call the jet sweep because we think we can get an edge and they got an edge and that that first sequence where they ran the ball so much was clearly McVeigh saying to uh to Mike McDonald like I got you I know what you're gonna do and after that first drive, then it kind of became more of a skill issue, right? It was talent against talent. And you saw Jadavian Clowney, like, literally just manhandle all the tackles. And, you know, Hamilton was making plays and Roquan was making plays. And it became very clear, like, one team is more talented than the other right now. But if a team with a similar talent level to the Ravens in terms of uh, talent up front, like, that can move them off the ball... If they take those cues from McVeigh in that first drive, where clearly he had figured out McDonald's tendencies in nickel, and then just copy paste that to a more talented offense, Ravens could be in trouble, at least stopping the run. The only reason the Rams were even in this game was because Stafford and Cup and, and Puka were able to make stuff happen through the air. Like, again, the pass protection did not hold up. And after that first quarter, they couldn't run the ball anymore, so they became a very one-dimensional team. But if a more talented team can just copy and paste that run game plan that can be more balanced and not so one-dimensional, the Ravens could have that sequence come back to bite them in January. Not saying it will happen, but it's the first time all year that I've sat back and said, hold up, somebody's got Mike McDonald's number. Like, of course, it's Sean McVay because he's Sean McVay. But that was the first time all year where I was like, hang on. This is something different. This is something that might actually work here. You know what it felt like to me as McVay's buddy that we've talked about several times this year on this podcast? Shanahan. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. I'm going to use my run game to force you to move a certain way on defense. And, and with Shanahan, the way we've talked about it, most of this year is to force you to play a coverage that is more beneficial for the rest of my offense, but I'm going to make you move. And McVay, it felt there was a little bit of that. And like you said, unfortunately, they ran into the Jimmy's and Joe's issues where Mike McDonald basically sat his defense down on the sideline and went, Hey, hang on, bow up. We're the Ravens. Like we got more talent than they do. We got to kick their ass like straight up. Yes, they know what we're doing, but we got to win our assignments. And if we do, we can cancel that out. And they did. But if you're talking about a team like the 49ers or like you said, a more talented team that takes that approach to say, we know what your rules are and we're going to use them to move you. And maybe our guys can win 50% of those. You know, we have guys that are as talented as you do, Ravens. And not many teams do, but some teams do. And certainly a team they could meet in the playoff might. Then we're going to see that, yeah, we're going to yank your chain. And we're going to see if you can straight up beat us, man, oh, man. And if not, you're going to have to try and move schematically to beat us. And then we know what we want to run, right? Because we've moved you. We've dictated as the offense to you, the defense. One more note, because, uh, again, the Ravens won the game. I don't want to make it seem like they lost the game yeah. here. I just I, I was so impressed by the Rams. But the only thing I was more impressed by was the individual performance of Lamar Jackson. He was stellar in this game, like ridiculous in this game. Accounted for like 380 yards of offense by himself. He was their leading rusher. He had 70 yards on 11 carries, plus 316 through the air, three touchdowns. Like, you know, the, the the throw to Odell, which credit to Odell, by the way, A, winning on the double move, and then B, kind of doing that classic Odell, like check one shoulder, check the other shoulder. You know, Zay made plays. like, But it really came down to Lamar just being unreal, like truly unreal. And, and he was the main reason why – they were able to kind of survive that onslaught from the Rams. And if they didn't have that kind of quarterback, call it a trap game, whatever you want to call it, like they would have lost. Like 100% they would have lost without Lamar. And there was one play, at least one play per quarter where he stepped out of a sack that is any other quarterback, it's a sack. Like, and I do mean any other quarterback in the league, it's a sack. Aaron Donald's got to be so freaking frustrated because he comes busting through like, clearly wins one-on-one -on -one, well one-on-one -on -one and a half uh against the ravens blockers and he just like shows up like yo lamar right in the middle lamar just okie dokes him <laughs> steps up aaron donald cat quick as always turns around like dives at his back lamar's already going to the right like it just preternatural pocket movement 
unreal. I We've said magician multiple times, or I have at least on this podcast, just magicked his way out of at least one sack a quarter, one explosive play, what would have been an explosive play for the defense every quarter. In a game this tight, you don't think that makes the difference? Probably does. And it was purely just on him. Like that is... It's not like, oh, he's getting help from his receivers or always oh, getting help from scheme or whatever. That is just a one-on-one athletic, like, whoa, okay, Aaron Donald's in my lap. Guess I'll move. Like, not many people can do that. In fact, almost nobody can do that. Now, I'm, I'm going to kind of jump ahead in our outline because I want to I want to hit this topic while it's a good segue. Uh, Dak, who is more likely... To, to win MVP to Lamar right now, even though I said I'd vote for Lamar, like acknowledging the realism of mm-hmm. it's Dak's award to lose at this point. Yeah. I also want to give him his credit because even as good as Dak has been throughout his career, he too has never played this well before. And even though, you know, I would say the offense kind of reverted to some past tendencies this week in terms of not using motions, especially not using motion at the snap. I don't necessarily think that it was a a poorly called game for McCarthy at all. I mean, clearly they put up 33 points. Like, the offense was just fine. I think it was more a reflection of they don't respect that Eagles secondary whatsoever to the point where they didn't think they needed to use motion or anything like that to create space. They could just line up and go play and beat the hell out of them, and they did. But you still got to go do that. Like, you still got to line up and beat the hell out of them. And Dak was just throwing darts last night there was the one bad play where well bad with an asterisk you know he he had a receiver that had like four steps on a corner yeah surprise surprise against that secondary and he kind of tunnel visioned on it down the field meanwhile Fletcher Cox was running through Zach Martin forced to fumble Eagles got a defensive TD Uh, that was like his one negative play the entire night of just not noticing Fletcher Cox coming to eat his soul other than that he was perfect. Like, he was incredible again. And because of how good the Cowboys are as a team, because of how complete they look, because of how dominant they look on a week-to-week basis, with really only a couple hiccups the entire season, there was the game against the 49ers, and then there was the the early weird game against the Cardinals. But they've looked fine since week five. More than fine. They've looked great since week five. They very easily could have 2 0 the Eagles this year, you know, were it not for four inches the first time around. So I totally understand the Dak for MVP campaign. If Dak wins MVP, I'm not going to say that anybody else got robbed because he's played that good this year. Again, I personally would vote for Lamar, but I also acknowledge, like, realistically, Dak is probably going to win it because of how good he's played in his own right. And he does deserve. Like, all the accolades that he has coming, like, he deserves it. He's been phenomenal. He has continued to learn and progress, and I think that's one of the greatest credits to an athlete who has played at a very high level before. It's not like he was, oh, in dire need of development. He could have continued playing at the level he played at in year one, in year two, in year four. He's continued to sort of learn and adapt and try new things to make himself and this team better. And in a strange way, it reminds me of McCarthy's successor in Green Bay when LaFleur got there and brought a new way of doing things to an established veteran quarterback who didn't always agree with him. And Aaron Rodgers was like, no, I've been super successful. We're not going to change this. It's my rules. And LaFleur, you know, behind the scenes mostly said, "Uh uh-uh, we are because I'm going to make you better. But you got to believe and you got to buy in. And Aaron did. And then Aaron became the sort of apostle for that Aaron became like, I didn't, I didn't think he was a right at first, but now that I've done it his way, it's clearly better. And I'm going to be even better. And now we're, you know, completely mind melded. We're vibing and I'm, we're crushing everybody. And I feel like Dak to a certain extent has bought into a different way of doing things this year. And we're seeing different results that are even greater than his previously very high heights. And that's what makes this Dallas team so dangerous. Like the defense is exceptional. We talked about that with Mahomes, right? The defense is exceptional for KC, but in Dallas's case, Dak is 
clearly like on the same page and buying in. And if you listen to the commentators last night in his meeting with them, he was saying, no, no, like I've found a new way. Like I'm doing things differently. You really have to understand it was right there the whole time. <laughs> like he is on a different plane of playing quarterback right now and it's showing up on the field. And I agree with you. That makes this Dallas team the most dangerous Dallas team we've seen in recent history. Not too long ago, uh, I, I know you tend to stay far away from sports talk TV, and <laughs> it's probably best for your mental health. It is. Uh, there was a there's a guy on FS1. Uh, I think his name's like Craig Carton or something like that. I, so, again, I don't even care to really learn his name. Um, <laughs> but there was a clip that that went out there of oh. Dak's going to be distracted now that he's had a kid I, and, yeah, you know, and he's, oh, he's, he's going to, he's going to play poorly now. And I'm like, dude, you've never seen dad reflexes or dad strength. <laughs> like, no, he's, he's going to have a fucking superpower now. Like uh, he's never going to be better. Yeah. Like, you know, and, from firsthand experience, like right, how he'll be physically able to through, you just change. Yeah. He'll be able to work <laughs> through sleep deprivation without a second thought. Like he's going to be better. No, I, you know, I, Everybody has to have takes. We've, we've talked quite a bit, actually, this season about, uh, you know, sports media and, and how polarizing it can be and, and what quote unquote sells and what doesn't. But if people are paying attention to what's occurring, like if they're actually watching and it's hard to do for the whole league, like we get to do it because it's our job and, and we're incredibly lucky to be able to do that. There's a lot of people that can't. And so they just stick with the narrative from whenever the last time they checked in on the Cowboys or Dak or the Eagles or Lamar or whatever. And, you know, I ran into that last week with some takes on Sam Howell. People were like, oh, Sam Howell's a statue. And I was like, you know, he's getting hit a lot, but that's not because he's a statue. Like the opposite, like, but I was like, oh, these people follow another team. And, you know, it's just not a thing they keep up on. And I'm not going to hold it against them, but some of the coolest stuff, I would say the coolest stuff, the stuff that charges me up the most about following an NFL season is the stuff that changes, right? The teams that were super powerful in the beginning and have completely fallen apart or the teams that we wrote off, like the Packers, who are clearly a team right now that nobody wants to play. Like if the playoffs started today, nobody really wants to draw the Packers in the first round. Like there's teams that can beat them for sure, but Nobody wants to play them right now. There are some. They don't want it. They don't want right. it. They don't want that smoke. And so those changes. And Dallas, we talked about it. They started in a way that was very flat. And we were guilty of the same thing. We said, McCarthy, McCarthying again. He's going to waste all this talent. And then the light came on for the coach and the quarterback. And they shifted. The motion tendencies went way up. And all of a sudden, they started playing the best ball that they've played in a very long time. And that's the coolest stuff for me as an analyst is, oh, they're getting it. Like the lights coming on, whether it's players or teams or units within teams, offenses or defenses. That's the coolest stuff. This is going to be a super clunky transition. Uh, so I apologize to the audience, but we have talked about it a couple of times and I feel like it's now at the point where we need to address it. Okay. The Bears defense is good, EJ. Somehow, some way, the Bears defense is good. And, you know, I, I went through this morning and I watched every single play from the Lions game, uh, you know, watching Montez Sweat tear people's face off. And it's like, cool, that trade worked out. Good on you, Ryan Poles. That's great. But what really stuck out the most to me was nobody's screwing up. Like, there's no blown assignments ever. Like, they're not doing anything crazy. Like, Phil Snow, you know, there'll be, there'll be a couple fun pressures a quarter. But, like, it's cover three. They're just playing cover three. And they're really good at it. Like, really, really good at cover three. They just don't screw it up. And, and that's kind of like the hard part of playing cover three is like you can be as simplistic as you want to be. You just have to play all your assignments because cover three has built in answers for everything. OK, like people have been playing it for generations at this point. Like there's answers for every concept you're going to see. You just got to do them and they're doing them. They have the lowest explosive pass rate allowed from cover three in the entire NFL. In the entire NFL, or at least since week nine, right, when the the snow era started, I guess you could say, but like they're 
legitimately Fort Knox when they're in that coverage. And it's their main coverage they play. And I, I do feel like yeah, there's go been... Figure. <laughs> I know, go figure. I do feel like there's been an emphasis of like, hey, we're not going to run everything. We're not going to be mm-hmm. super fancy. We're not going to be like the Ravens where you never know what we're, we're going to be in. Like, you're going to know what we're in. Yeah, they're not exotic. We're going to be better at it. (laughs) They're not exotic at all. Like, they don't blitz that much. You know, their pressure rate's below average, but their coverage and their tackling ability is so good. They just, they make it frustrating to play against because you know what they're in, they know you know what they're in, and they don't care because they're better than you. Like, it's, it's almost the best kind of defense because you don't have to think. You just line up and you do it. Yeah, and they were thinking a lot and not thinking the same way through the early part of the season. And, you know, I'll just take a shot to the notion that the Bears are universally bad across the board. They were in the beginning of the season, but here's the things that change. Thank you, Phil Snow. Cheers to you. Well, the most interesting thing is why. We need to go back and say, so why did it change? When we're talking about the Cowboys, why did the Cowboys offense change? Well, week five or six, they found the light of motion, specifically pre-snap motion and motion during the snap, and they started instituting it, and things started to change. So what was it about the Bears' defense that changed? This is courtesy of our buddy Bill Zimmerman. He put out a thing, uh, and it was after about week 10, and he said, okay, Uh, Up to week five in the five games before Phil Snow, because Phil Snow was hired right after the Vikings game. But during the press conference for that game, Luce came out and said how much fun he was having talking to Phil about planning for the Viking game. So he's clearly sort of in the building before he got hired. So five games before Phil Snow. And at that point, the five games after, well, we're up to eight games after now. So I figured I'd update that data for the full Phil Snow era. But the first part came from Bill. So credit to him. So, uh, you know, a bunch of statistics. And before Phil Snow, points per game, 27.2. Post Phil Snow, 19. So first Mm -hmm. five games, 27.2 games. Post Phil, 19 points a game. Yards per game, 384 before, 271 after. Yards per play, 6.2 drops to 4.56 yards per pass attempt. They were giving up eight yards of pass attempt before Phil Snow. Because like you said, a lot of communication errors, a lot of coverage breakdowns, just poor tackling, like you name it. They were just, they were bad all over the place. No pass rush in the first month. They couldn't, they couldn't buy a pass rush in the first month. Eight yards per pass attempt before Phil Snow, 5.73 after. Yards per rush. Now, this is where they've been good. They were sneaky good, and I'll say sneaky good because they were bad at everything else, but they were like top 10 in rushing defense, even in the first month. But they were good at it before Phil Snow. Yards per rush, 3.7. Pretty good. After Phil, 3.54. Even the good stuff went down. And this is the one that kills me. Percentage of third downs. So they gave up 57.3% of third downs before Phil Snow after 37%. So across the board, every one of those metrics, points, yards per game, yards per play, yards per pass attempt, yards per rush, and percentage on third downs, every one of them has dropped significantly since Phil Snow came along. The other thing that changed (laughs) that you nodded towards is Montez Sweat. Montez Sweat is crushing it. And uh, I think it was Rap that put this one up. Uh, this morning, Ian Rappaport, since uh, Montez Sweat joined the Bears in week nine, uh, again, four weeks or three weeks after we're crediting the Phil Snow change, Bears defense is ranked among the NFL's top five units in total defense, fifth pass defense, fifth from 30th previously, again, oh. and takeaways tied for second. So weeks one through eight points per game, 27-3. Weeks after Montez Sweat dropped to 18.2. These statistics all sound pretty similar to the Phil Snow bit, but it's just like Phil Snow got there. He was there for about three weeks and he went, guess what, guys? Like, I can do a lot of things, but I can't create a pass rush on my own. Like, I can't be out there in pads. You need to go get me somebody that's going to, like, give more pressure. And the scheme had started to do that in that three weeks where you could really tell what the difference was. Phil Snow brought more pressure and you could see it. 
because before that they were like straight for endlessly till your eyes bled like not even any stunts they would rush for and they wouldn't do it creatively and they would get no pressure in the three weeks in between they started to do things creatively they started to do te stunts you started and we we're like oh my god they're doing something but they still weren't very effective because oh yeah jimmy's and joe's they just didn't have a ton of guys that could win phil snow goes hey you got to get me a rusher they go out they trade for montez sweat And all of a sudden, all the stuff they're trying to do starts working because they've got a guy, as you said, that's out there tearing people's faces off. Now you've got a solid scheme with very few breakdowns, almost no coverage breakdowns, way better tackling across the board, which is just kind of really a point of emphasis. Oh, yeah. And now you have pass rush like you have effective pass rush, not the greatest, but way better than what you have. Strangely enough, coverage comes up on the back end. Takeaways come way up. Guys start catching the interceptions. I'm not exactly sure why, but like Jalen Johnson (laughs) suddenly has decided that catching him is better than not catching him. And the whole defense, kind of the rising tide lifts all boats. Started with the change to snow, sort of continued and got supercharged with the sprinkling in of Montez Sweat. And now like the Bears defense is a top five unit across the board. They are not a team that you want to play. And the reason we bring that up is not because the Bears are going to make any noise this year. They're not, even though they are officially in the hunt for a playoff spot, which is absurd. They could spoil some people. They're not mathematically eliminated yet? Not yet. Really? That's actually the most surprising part about all this. I thought they were done. Isn't it? Yeah, no, they snuck into the list because now they've won a couple and, and you know, they have decent strength schedules. They're not making the playoffs. That's not the point. The point is they're going to play a couple teams that are trying to make the playoffs. And look, the Lions came in full throat. They were healthy. They had everybody in the lineup for the whole week. They had all their coaches. Like, they had everything. And the Lions have been one of the most powerful offenses in the entire league. The Bears played them straight up and beat them largely because the defense stepped on their head. So teams that the Bears have left on the schedule, they got the Browns who are trying to make a a run in the AFC. We'll talk about them in a second. Uh, The Cardinals, who are long out of it, obviously. The Falcons, who are trying to stay in it in the NFC South. And then the Packers, Week 18. And there could be a lot, I mean a lot, riding on that game for Green Bay in week 18. So it would be nice, you know, from a Bears fan's perspective, you know, week 18. Let's see. Let's see if we can just kind of stick the knife in and twist two years in a row. (laughs) Yeah. Let's go piss on somebody's Wheaties from Green Bay. Yeah, it would, it would be cool, but it's particularly Browns and Packers in the remaining slate. Browns are trying hard to hold on. They're currently in the hunt and you know, We'll talk a little bit more about the Browns in just a second. But uh, yeah, Browns and Packers are the ones that need to be very careful because if they underestimate at least what the Bears defense is right now, they do it at their own peril because they are incredibly effective. And that is a massive change from where they started in September. One more note before we move on uh, to the Bears fans that are upset that they pretty much have no shot at Marvin Harrison Jr. anymore. Uh, like they, they're still probably going to get a quarterback at, at number one because they have a 94% chance of the number one pick now because Carolina lost again. Right now, the Bears' natural pick is at seven. You're not going to get Marvin. It's okay. You know why it's okay? Malik Neighbors exists. <laughs> Roma Dunze exists. Like you're going to get a receiver. You'll be fine. Just enjoy knocking down the Lions a peg, okay? Didn't compromise getting a quarterback. You're still and and I say this as somebody who loves Justin Fields. Financially speaking, it just makes so much sense to take a quarterback at one. They're probably going to trade Justin, and you're still going to get neighbors, or you're still going to get a Dunze. Just enjoy the wins. Take out Green Bay. Take out Cleveland. Go ham for the next month. I don't care if they run the table and they end up with like the twelfth pick. I don't give a shit. Enjoy it. Okay, enjoy having a good defense again. It's been a five-year period since they had a good one. Just have fun with it. (laughs) You know what you're asking, right? (laughs) For Bears fans to be happy, I know. It's not going to happen. I was going to say, that might be a bigger stretch than getting Marvin at seven. Uh, All right, last thing. As I write down in my notebook. Uh, Last thing I'm going to talk about today. 
again, filed this under things I never thought I would mention in December of this season. Joe Flacco is back, and he won a football game and then immediately went back to the practice squad, but he just showed up for like 24 hours and said, cool, you need to win? Let's, let's go win this game. And he looked good. You know, 300-plus yards coming off the couch, basically. You know, 38 years old, made a couple really nice throws. Uh, there was one where, you know, he escaped out the back door, made a throw on the run to the sideline where it's like, okay, 38, let's go. You got it. Um, let's go. <laughs> the thing that really yeah. stuck out to me, though, beyond just seeing Joe Flacco win a game for the Browns <laughs> in the year of our Lord 2023, was how bad – the Jaguars defense looked like all the credit in the world to Joe, but oh my God, the Jags have problems like real substantive structural problems. And, you know, we've talked multiple times this year about how their pass rush would get a bunch of pressure, but couldn't get home and finish sacks. They weren't getting any pressure in this game. They had the fourth worst pressure rate in the entire NFL this week. It was like 18%. That's like September bears level. Okay, it was bad. They could not get any pressure whatsoever on Joe. Uh, they they had constant miscommunications on the back end. The the first two touchdowns, they just lost David Njoku. They just didn't know where he was. And then the last one, there was a bunch check that they screwed up where, you know, um, it, they they at least to me, again, I'm not in the room, but at least to me, looking at it on tape, In terms of how they were handling their bunch check off motion, one of them thought they were lock and level, which means all of them are going to be locked on a particular guy, and then they handle that guy wherever they go. And the other one thought that they were going to banjo the two guys that were off the line of scrimmage. So you have a a point guy that's impressed man, and then the two guys behind him in the bunch, whoever goes left, the inside guy takes. Whoever goes right, the outside guy takes. One of them thought they were – it's called a banjo adjustment. One of them thought they were doing that, and he was just going to take whoever the inside threat was, and the other thought they were locked and leveled. And so when they did all these switch releases, two guys ended up on the one who went first inside, and then the last one was just completely wide open and and just ran it all the way. So, you know, for me, I'm like, dude, it's week 14. How are you screwing up a bunch check in week 14? What are we doing here? You know, how how are you not getting pressure when you have how much... How many resources invested in this D line at this point? Like, it's 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 systemic. It's it's at their core. It's very wrong in Jacksonville. Like, I don't know how to fix this. I really don't. Because if we're three and a half months into the season, and you can't handle man coverage against a bunch without screwing it up, what are you going to do in January? Like, what are you going to do against against Lamar? And Odell and Zay, what are you going to do against Miami? God forbid Miami. They had to play them right now. So I I have real concerns about the Jags. And there's kind of been like little stuff, you know, throughout the year that's like bubbling underneath where you're like, "Uh, it's probably going to be okay, but that's not great. You know, like they were bad in the red zone. They were bad third down. Uh, Again, they had a high pressure rate, but a low sack rate. I'm like, "Eh, it'll probably work itself out. And then it never did. And then it got worse. And to have... 38-year-old Joe Flacco come off the bench and beat you while Trevor Lawrence is putting up five turnover-worthy plays in the same game, like literally just throwing three arm punts and playing maybe the worst game that I've seen him play in terms of like just giving the ball away. Like obviously he still made plays and he he did some crazy throws because he's Trevor, but like that it, it came with really, really bad decisions to the point where I'm like, Trevor, what are you doing? It's first and 10. Why are you just chucking it down the field? What are you doing? So there's just, there's so much wrong with Jacksonville right now. And they are, they've got to be relieved that the Colts and Texans also shit the bed at the same time because they came so close to losing control of this division. Like so close. They have to realize that. And, and I hope that they realize that they're, there is something at the core of this team that is straight up wrong. And if they come out and they play that way in January, they will lose by 30. Like, they will. They will. It's, it's, it's just bad. It's all bad, EJ. I don't know how to fix it. <laughs> well, we can look at the last team we talked about because everything was bad for the Bears in September. They were terrible. They weren't like, oh, they're just a couple. Uh, they weren't a couple anythings away. 
they were a couple of country miles away from everything good. And now, like with some changes that I don't necessarily think Jacksonville is primed or going to make, and that's where the rub comes in, like Jacksonville is loaded with players on the defensive side of the ball. They have a lot of players who have played well and made plays this year, right? Individually, but defense has to play as a unit, right? The front end, the pass rush has to support the coverage and the coverage has to agree. And if that happens, the Jags have plenty of dudes. This is not a Jimmy's and Joe's or an injuries issue or anything else. They have guys at every level that we like. They have athletes. They have guys that compete. But right now they are not playing together and therefore they're not playing anywhere near their capability. And I agree with you if they hit a serious team in January in the playoffs, in playoff football, when things tighten up a little bit and mistakes really matter, they're they're going to get rolled off the field. Like it's not going to be particularly close despite all the talent that they've accumulated. And that's really frustrating. Trevor, I'm going to give him a little bit of a pass. He got his leg bent in half like spaghetti, came out, and played the next game. Like I, I don't even know how that's physically possible given the injury. Does that affect his decision-making? Well, not typically, but he definitely was pressing yesterday. And again, if you're doing that on that side of the ball, and they have tons of players on offense. We've seen all of them go off at different times this year and sometimes together. And in those cases, they put up a lot of points and rolled teams. It didn't look like that yesterday against the Browns. And honestly, if you were talking about who was making the smarter plays, it was Joe Flacco at 38 and a half years old, which, by the way, is the oldest starting quarterback in the league this year. Unless, of course, you're going to give Aaron credit for his four snaps at 40 years old. Other <laughs> Technically, than that, yeah. Other than that, Joe Flacco is the oldest starting quarterback in the league this year. Sure didn't look like it. 26 out of 45, 311, three touchdowns and a pick. Um, you know, against that Jags D that certainly had something to play for, but didn't play as a unit, made some outstanding individual plays, but also had, you know, obvious busts that allowed, you know, easy touchdowns. Um, kind of felt like David and Joku hung out with Travis Kelsey at tight end university and said, Hey man, give me a little <laughs> bit of that magic dust where people just forget about you and you're always open. And Kelsey sold him a little bit and Joku put it in his tee before the, before the Jaguars game, because the first half he just dominated. Um, but the Jags, yeah, they got some issues. Can they clean them up? They can, but again, what happened with the bears was a complete system change. Like coordinator left, uh, they struggled. They walked in the wilderness for a while and then they hired a guy off the street and it clicked and it worked. Um, and they had a talent infusion on top of that. Like, I don't necessarily think the Jags need the talent infusion, but they do need to sort of get back to basics, maybe play a few less coverages and try and play as the ones that they play the most, the best. I mean, other than that, I'm with you. I don't have any, I don't think there are any easy answers, but you got to simplify it because right now they're screwing it up and they're not playing fast as a unit. And that's causing them to be very, very vulnerable at the worst possible time. It's just such a frustrating team to watch. And they are as frustrating, honestly, as the Browns are rewarding. Uh, Cause the Browns, I, I do genuinely get so much joy out of watching their defense play like it is from an aesthetic perspective it's it's one of my most aesthetically pleasing defenses this year because <laughs> very similar to the bears like they don't do a whole lot it's like ah, we're gonna play cover one we're gonna play cover one in like four different ways but we're gonna play cover one and then we're just gonna tell miles to go kill people and he's gonna go kill people you know we're gonna let all of our corners and grant delp it uh, who've been phenomenal this year, by the way. Like, we're just gonna leave them out on islands because we, you know, we know they're better than you. And it's it's such a perfect defense because it's what happens when a, a DC realizes that all of his toys are a lot shinier than all of your toys, and he just lets them, he just lets them go, right? Yeah. All the knives are a lot sharper in the drawer. Yes, yes, right. And so I I love watching this Browns defense play. Just because they're murderous simplicity. And this was another example of it. And if the Browns make the playoffs, which right now, again, they're the five seeds, so they're probably going to. Hard pre hard pressed to think they're not going to. But I do think that they have a shot to win a playoff game just because of that. Because whoever's playing quarterback for them is not going to have to climb out of a crazy hole. 
it's going to be a three to seven point game regardless because this defense is so good. And, you know, three to seven points. If Njoku makes a crazy play, cool, you're in it. If Amari or Jerome Ford breaks off a 80 yard run like he did against Indy, you're in it, right? Like Cleveland's got a shot here because of that defense. And, and I genuinely love watching that unit play. We said at the beginning of the year that, you know, if the quarterbacking situation was a little bit different, it would be one of the easiest teams to root for in the entire league. And, you know, what really reminded me of, like, what Flacco brings that they haven't had at quarterback is David freaking Bell scored. Like oh, a David, 41 yarder. <laughs> David Bell is still in the league. Like, David Bell, you know, arguably not my favorite receiver coming out. I thought he was pretty limited, and, like, his guy fell down. It's not like he, like, flat out beat somebody and made some crazy double move. But, like, Flacco's like, dude, that guy's open. I'm going to throw it to him. Like, I don't care who it is, and they have all these weapons, and Flacco's like, I'm just going to take what the defense gives me because I've seen it all. As a 38-and-a-half-year-old quarterback with a ton of starts under my belt, I've seen it all, and I've realized at this advanced stage of my career that if I can make it easy, I should just make it easy. So I'm just going to throw it to the open guy. And still, the offense looks way more powerful because he's just back there operating it on a very sort of even and neutral basis. And that makes you know Cleveland as fun on offense as they are on defense for all the reasons you mentioned. All right, we have uh, a lot more teams that we could have talked about today. There's a lot going on in the NFL, clearly. Uh, we're already over an hour, and we're we only talked about like five different games. If you guys have your own storylines that you would love for us to cover in our second show this week, leading into week 15, feel free to drop those in the comments. We, we want to know what you guys want us to talk about and give our opinions on, especially so we can get a head start on research uh, for all these week 15 matchups. Also make sure to come by the TNF live stream this Thursday for Chargers Raiders, which I'm not 100% sure if Justin Herbert's going to play. There's been rumors among certain sections of NFL media that Herbert might have a broken uh finger on his throwing hand and could potentially be shut down for the rest of the year so we'll find out probably tonight or tomorrow if herbert's even going to go but if not hey we get to watch easton stick on thursday night that sounds like a good time ej am i selling this correctly uh well if, as long as you mention aiden like yeah let's do it that's easton stick versus aiden o'connell <laughs> in december <laughs> let's go <laughs> oh god yeah this is gonna be fun uh, I'm, I'm trying my best to be a trooper through this. Oh, wait, here's here's a selling point. So I in last uh, Thursday stream, I was on medication, so I couldn't do it. But on oh. this Thursday stream, I'm finally doing the Michael Scott drink oh, that uh, our patrons lovingly or perhaps maliciously donated to make me do during the TNF stream, which I think is like absinthe, scotch, two packs oh. of Splenda, rum like it's it's it sounds like an la freeway but like worse so it it does not sound good hopefully it gets me inebriated enough that i don't remember that game that's the goal i might have to do a couple of those anyway uh (laughs) yeah i think i'm properly selling this tnf stream make sure to come by hang out with us for what i hope to be a decent football game uh leave your suggestions for the second show this week Thank you to all of our uh, executive producers over on Patreon. Once again, Marat, Consti, Andrew, Liam, Connor, and Mike L. Once again, couldn't do it without you guys. We're going to get out of here now. We'll see you guys in a couple days. Hope you guys have a good week. And until then, later.